Okay, so we're going to talk about ridge regression, all right? Um, so there's one thing. Uh, so well, before we before we dive into ridge regression, we wanted to briefly review uh, what we said about uh, matrix inverse uh, for linear algebra, right? So uh, we have uh, the uh, basically a set of linear equations from a times x equal to b. And uh, we could find uh, the solution to that as x equal to the inverse of a times b, right? So uh, we could do that uh, only uh, when the inverse of matrix A exists. And it exists uh, only if and only if uh, these two conditions hold. And number one, that A must be a square matrix. Okay, so the number of rows and columns uh, must be identical. And let's say they're identical. They're all uh, n uh, dimensions. And the second one is that all the rows are linearly independent, which implies the columns are also linearly independent. Okay, so uh, a, there's a concept, concept called the rank. And the rank is basically the number of independent, uh, linearly independent rows or columns of the matrix A. That is to say, this square matrix A has an inverse if and only if the rank of A is equal to n. Okay, there are n number of uh, independent rows or n number of independent columns. And sometimes we use the shorthand, we say A is full rank. And there are two important uh, uh, properties of rank, which is number one, um, if A is the product of two functions, uh, two of, uh, sorry, if A is the product of a matrix and its transpose, say B transpose B, and then B is uh, M rows and N columns, so that, you know, the B transpose B uh, result is still N by N, okay, then uh, the rank of A is the smaller one of M or N. Okay, so this is this is really important because uh, we we are looking at we're going to be uh, sorry we we used uh, the inverse of x transpose x. Okay, so this matrix x x transpose x better have an inverse, right? If if it doesn't have an inverse, then we do have a problem. And uh, if for it for it to have an inverse, this matrix must be full rank. But uh, x is not a square matrix. x is um, n by p plus 1, right? So the rank of this matrix is uh, the rank of the matrix x transpose x is less than or equal to the minimum of n and p plus 1, OK? And we know that in order for x transpose x to have a full rank, to have rank n, uh, to have to have an inverse, it must have rank uh, uh, p plus 1, right? Because x transpose x is p plus 1 by p plus 1. Uh, for this matrix to have an inverse, it must have rank uh, p plus 1. That is to say, if n is less than p plus 1, uh, then this matrix cannot have rank p plus 1. It will have rank n, and n is less than p plus 1, and there's no inverse. Okay, so, so that's that's really kind of a uh, important property um, uh, of rank. And we can see that some cases, uh, in some certain situations, uh, we wouldn't have the inverse. Okay, so is is this x transpose x matrix invertible? Um, because x is n by p plus one, x transpose x is p plus one by p plus one, and based on the reasoning we just had, uh, the number of data points n has to be greater than. Uh, p plus 1 or equal to p plus 1 for the uh, matrix to be invertible. 
uh, if if that's that's a problem, right? If you have too few data points, um, you have a problem. And at least uh, the p plus one data points uh, must be linearly independent. Okay, so so those two are important conditions and uh, sufficient and necessary conditions for this matrix to be invertible. Okay. Um, but it does it may not hold. So sometimes we have fewer data points than features than parameters uh, than we have to estimate. So uh, we could have a problem. We don't have enough data points so that the matrix is not invertible. Okay, so if A is low rank, um, if A is low rank, then uh, this function, this, this set of linear equations for X is, uh, this A inverse doesn't exist. And uh, you, can, you can understand this as uh, that the set of linear equations is under constraint. So you could have more than one solution and therefore there's no unique solution. So you cannot really do like A inverse times B, which would give you a unique solution, but you couldn't do that. Okay, so, so there's no so there's no way you can find this this inverse of A. Okay. Um, so, so how do we make this equation uh, possible? How do we make the equation work uh, how do we find this inverse? And the solution to that is to uh, find a new matrix, x transpose x plus lambda times i. So lambda is actually a very small positive value. Uh, could be like 0 0.01 or something like that. Um, and it's added onto the diagonals of x transpose x. So uh, we wouldn't do the proof here. Uh, it's actually not very hard, uh, but uh, we, we don't have the time. So we wouldn't do the proof here, but uh, you can, if you Google, you can find the answer. Uh, we can show that this matrix, as long as you have lambda uh, being a positive number, uh, this matrix will be invertible. So we can find uh, this uh, inverse and we'll do everything uh, like we did before. All right. So this is okay uh, because lambda is a small number. So it really doesn't change the X transpose X matrix too much. So in principle, you still get pretty much the same answers, um, but uh, uh, now you have you have some uh, computable invertible matrix uh, that you can do. Otherwise, you couldn't find the solution, right? So that solution is known as the ridge regression solution to linear regression. Okay, so. As it turns out, so the first reason that we're doing this ridge regression is pretty straightforward, right? We don't have an invertible matrix and we are doing a mathematical trick uh, to make sure there is an inverse that we can find, okay? Now, it turns out that there is a deeper uh, reason or a deeper uh, fact that underlie this mathematical trick, okay? It turns out that ridge regression is also a solution to a optimization problem, which is slightly different from the problem we saw earlier. Okay, so previously we have the MSE loss, but now we are adding one more term to the MSE loss. This is one over n times lambda times the norm of beta squared. Okay, so uh, to find the solution to this optimization problem, we'll do the same thing. We take the derivative against the beta and set it to zero, okay? So uh, we, we, uh, if, you, if you do the mathematics, I'm not gonna do it here, but you'll find that you have the same solution. Or maybe I should do it here. Uh, so X transpose, you can take a look at this part and let this be zero. And uh, I'll try to find the right beta, right? So I have X transpose X beta minus X transpose Y plus lambda times beta equal to zero. And I wanted to move betas to one side and everything else to the other side. So I have x transpose x plus lambda, oops, beta times lambda beta. Uh, and that is equal to x transpose y. And I wanted to take the common factor out of the first two terms, but I kind of cannot do that because uh, lambda add uh, a matrix X transpose X, uh, these two things cannot be added together because one is a scalar, the other is a matrix, and a matrix adding a scalar, I, I don't know how to do that, but I can write things in a slightly different manner. 
which is lambda times i times beta, right? So i is the identity matrix, and i multiplying anything is still i. So that's fine. So I can do that. And now I can, I can extract the common multiplicative factor uh, that becomes x transpose x plus lambda i times beta is equal to x transpose y. So now I can take the inverse, assuming the inverse exists, and I do know that the same inverse does exist. And so I can modify both sides uh, with the inverse of this matrix, of the underscored matrix. And I find a solution for ridge regression, right? So this is nothing but a solution to a different optimization problem, okay? So, so what is happening uh, if we think about it? We just said that when um, x transpose x doesn't have an inverse, it's equivalent to like when ax equal to b uh, and a doesn't have an inverse, that means the problem uh, in uh, if, if A is low rank, um, so it could be under constrained or over constrained, but uh, in this case is under constrained. Okay, so when when A is under constrained, then you don't have A minus A inverse B because you know there are multiple possible solutions. There's no unique solution. But now we're saying, okay, we want to also optimize uh, in addition to the this part, the first part. I also wanted to optimize. Yeah. The uh, mean, uh, sorry, the 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 norm of beta, and if I have multiple possible solutions, I will always pick the one solution with the least norm, and that is an important tiebreaker. And it turns out, if you do that, um, as our math shows, you will find a unique solution to the optimization problem. Okay, so so that we prefer the one with the least L two norm among the possible betas we have. And that gave us the ridge regression solution. Okay. So um, we when we add this uh, model parameter, the norm of the model parameter, um, and multiplying a coefficient lambda, or in this case lambda over n, or it could be a small number, right? So when you have a term like that in your loss function, this is known as L two regularization, okay? So this means that in addition to whatever loss we have, we also want to find a solution with the smallest norm, okay? So this is a form of regularization. And it turns out, why is this useful? It turns out that uh, if you do some mathematical analysis, um, this ridge regression estimator for beta um, has lower variance than the OLS estimator. It, it's going to be also biased. Uh, so it's, it may not be, uh, you know, great because we have bias variance trade-off, right? But in some cases, we would really prefer lower bias, lower bias and in other cases, we would really prefer lower variance because uh, the, the variance of an estimator is often associated with how much data you have. And when you have little amount of data, your variance is going to be pretty high. And when you have high variance, and that's going to be a major factor that determines that you know you're not going to estimate the uh, uh, you're not going to estimate the parameters very well, mainly not because of the bias, but because of the variance. And because you know you may have some outlier data points in your data set, and you don't have a lot of data to begin with. So these outlier data points will, it will have disproportionately influence on your estimate, and you don't want that. If you have that, you have high variance, and your estimate for beta is going to be far away from the true beta, and that's bad, right? That means you don't generalize. You don't work well on the test set you haven't seen before, okay? So once you, once you reduce variance, then you can generalize. So that's how regularization uh, reduces the test error, uh, even though it may increase training error, right? So um, that's the bias variance trade-off. And uh, when we have small amount of data, we would favor really favor lower variance. Um, and this is one form of regularization, and we will see other forms of regularization later on in this course.
Um, so we could also think about ridge regression from a prob probabilistic perspective or uh, linear regression and ridge regression, both from a probabilistic perspective. Um, so we remember that we have the model parameterized by beta and it takes input x. So we could write to the output as uh, a function of uh, beta and x, uh, but beta, we will put that as a subscript uh, denoting this really part of the function and x is really the input to the function, okay? So we could interpret uh, this value, the function value as a parameter to a Gaussian distribution. So it's a mu uh, to the Gaussian distribution and we have standard deviation one, okay? So uh, if we have that, then uh, we can think of the ground truth value as a sample that we draw from the Gaussian distribution. So we have uh, y that, yi tilde, meaning we draw from this distribution. This is the Gaussian, the normal distribution. And this is the mean of the Gaussian. And this is the variance of the Gaussian, okay? So, uh, so that's kind of a notation. And this is equivalent to the following. So y is the ground truth value, yi, which is equal to what we computed, what we model, our model predicted, plus a small error. And the error is actually drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So this is uh, this is some kind of perhaps measurement error um, that, uh, that came from, I don't know, some external process when you collect the data points, okay? Or, you know, uh, the, whatever, whatever happens, we kind of sweep them under the rug of Gaussian noise. Okay, um, so so if we do that, you know, we could we could think of this as some form of maximum likelihood estimates, right? So we talk about maximum likelihood when we talk about um, um, uh, probability theory, right? So, uh, but uh, we had data points denoted as x one to x n. Uh, we're going to change things slightly. So we're going to be uh, doing yi and y1 and yn. Okay. And uh, the parameters are, the model parameters are mu, the mean, and sigma, the standard deviation. And uh, uh, because the data points are iid, independent and identically distributed, uh, we can write to the overall distribution as a product of the individual probabilities of the individual y's, and this is the uh, PDF, okay? And we're gonna do the same thing as we did, so I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. Um, if you don't remember what we did, I think it's a good time to review the maximum likelihood portion of the probability part of our course. Um, so we'll take the log, basically take the log of the whole thing, remove anything that's unrelated to mu. So if I take the log, and uh, we have this part, but this is like unrelated to mu, and it cancels with log cancels with exponential function. So we, we got to something like that. And again, the uh, denominator two sigma squared, that's unrelated to mu whatsoever. So we can ignore that as well. So um, if you do the, do the math, and uh, it turns out that we can find the best mu as the mu that minimizes uh, the sum of the uh, squared loss sum of the squared difference between y and mu. Okay, now that's a little interesting because that seems awfully similar to what we had earlier, which is yi, the ground truth, minus the model prediction, uh, yi hat, and we uh, sum the individual difference squared and we do a one over n, right? But one over n doesn't matter, it's a constant. Um, so we can disregard that. So we're really just minimizing this part. And if you compare the two part, you will see that we're just replacing the mu with our model prediction, y i hat, right? So that's that's really interesting. So, so once again, we're gonna let mu be uh, different for different y's, okay? It turns out mu is 
uh, not the same value as in the normal Gaussian distribution, but it's dependent on my input x. And the dependence is this f beta x. This is a function that we learn. Okay, and that gives me basically uh, the model prediction. Okay, so so uh, this is how basically how I find beta. Beta is, you know, I find beta to minimize this part of the uh, error function, right? So so that's that's really the same thing as the maximum likelihood estimate for uh, for mu or for for the beta parameter uh, where the beta parameter controls the uh, value of mu i, and mu i here is the uh, mean of the Gaussian distribution, only that this mean changes from data point to data point, right? Previously in the old uh, maximum likelihood estimate, the mean is the same. Every data point is drawn from the same distribution. Uh, here, uh, they're somewhat different in the sense that uh, every data point is drawn from its own distribution, they're all Gaussian, but they have different means. And they have the same standard deviation, but they have different means. Okay, so therefore, uh, we come to the realization that linear regression can be understood as maximum likelihood if we assume the label contains noise from the Gaussian distribution, or uh, the label comes from a Gaussian distribution um, with parameter, with input dependent means. So those are identical. Uh, statements. Okay, so we can write things in this way as well, and that is identical to what we just said. Okay, so that's a really interesting observation uh, for ridge, for uh, linear regression. And for ridge regression, uh, this part is optional, so this wouldn't appear in the test, but I think it's really interesting to talk about it. So the ridge regression part is that um, um, there is a also a probabilistic uh, interpretation for ridge regression, and uh, it's known as a maximum a posterior uh, estimate. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, other than saying that we are trying to constrain um, beta uh, by say by imposing a Gaussian distribution on top of it. So the Gaussian distribution is centered at mean. The center is zero, sorry, um, this is beta, and center is centered at zero, and the variance is uh, inversely inversely proportional to uh, lambda. So if you have a small lambda, then you could have a large variance, um, so the distribution is kind of flat, and you really don't have a lot of constraint on beta. Beta can take pretty much any value it wants to, uh, but if you have a large lambda, then uh, the variance are gonna be small, and beta will be constrained heavily to a value around zero, right? So, so we're trying to constrain beta somewhat, and you can think of that as, as some kind of Bayesian inference. Okay, so, so we wouldn't need you to understand this very much for the purpose of the quiz and uh, the project and so on. So uh, if you don't understand what I just said, uh, that is perfectly fine. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, to, to make sure like you have at least heard of uh, these ideas, right? Like ridge regression is really some form of uh, Bayesian inference. Okay, so anyhow, uh, we talked about four different perspectives to understand ridge regression, and I wanted to recap them here because there are really different ways to look at the same thing. Um, and you may ask, like, why bother? You know, like understanding each one is kind of uh, difficult, uh, requires a lot of thinking. Why do I want to understand the same thing from four different ways? Well, I can understand it from one way and the one way works perfectly well. So why do I need to understand the same thing from four different perspectives? And the issue is um, there will be situations where some understandings are more useful um, or other understandings don't help you that much, right? There are situations where you need, for example, um, to work with the linear algebra side of things, where there are situations where you want to work with the probability side of things. And um, understanding, um, the, if you understand all these things, that means you have a lot of tools in your toolbox and you can use uh, these machine learning tools very flexibly. Um, if you understand it only from one perspective, you would not be very flexible and you would not be able to handle 
a lot of different machine learning scenarios. So that is kind of the high level message. Uh, so we're not really doing some ivory tower mental exercise that uh, we're just trying to make the course hard and uh, make people feel uncomfortable. That's that's not our purpose, right? We're really trying to um, give you the the foundations that you need uh, to to make this to put these things into work. Okay, so long story short, um, we have four different perspectives, and the first one is known as the matrix inverse perspective. It is ridge regression. It's basically a simple mathematical trick that allows you to find the matrix inverse and uh, allows you to find a unique solution to the regression problem. Second one is you can think of this as a solving a set of linear equations. And uh, because the matrix is low rank, so it would under constrain the solution so we cannot find a unique solution. And by imposing the uh, preference on the parameter norm, right? we say we want a parameter that has the least norm among all possible solutions that would minimize the MSE, we would find a unique solution. So that's the linear equation perspective. Um, there is the regularization or machine learning generalization perspective. Um, that is to say, when we put um, the when we put uh, a regularization term, um, we are able to reduce the variance. We're able to reduce the effects of outlier data points. Okay. So that would reduce the variance and that would uh, help us uh, get close to the quote unquote true uh, beta uh, that, uh, you know, if you consider the data points are generated from a true model, uh, we'll get closer to that um, because of the low variance. Therefore, uh, we get a better model and that will generalize. So this is the effect of regularization. And finally, uh, we can th see this as a, some kind of Bayesian statistics, uh, uh, which is adding a Gaussian prior to beta, uh, which pushes it close to zero. Okay, so, so these are all different ways to look at ridge regression. Um, once again, we wanted to recap uh, what we did for linear regression and ridge regression. And first of all, we collected some data points. We specified a model, beta transpose xi. We define a loss function, and uh, we could be using the ordinary least square loss function, uh, x1, uh, xi minus xi hat squared, and sum together and take the average. Or we could do the uh, ridge regression uh, loss function, which has one uh, regular regularization term. Uh, and then we find the beta that minimizes the loss function. We're using um, the closed form solution, right? So we managed to write down the mathematical equation um, that gave us directly the parameter. So some part of that is innate and some part of that is experiential. Um, and these are kind of the fundamental supervised learning, machine learning recipe that works for mach shallow machine learning, classic machine learning, as well as uh, uh, deep learning. So, so I think this is this is the most important recipe um, in this course. Now, uh, we know that linear models are still very limited. And in many cases, um, we still don't have a linear model. We could have a quadratic function um, like this one. And the linear model would not be able to represent this thing very well. Okay, so for example, if you want to try to fit a linear function, linear a straight line to these data points, you would get to this brown line which really doesn't capture the data points very well. Um, and But that is really not the worst type of uh, errors. The worst type, I think, happens when you have these known, these things called uh, linear intercolation. Sorry, extrapolation. Linear interpolation may be okay. But linear extrapolation is what really gets into, into trouble. So extrapolation means that you have observed data points falling into a particular range. Let's say this is my uh, observed range. Okay. And based on these data points, it seems a linear function can describe the data points pretty well, right? Because we really didn't observe the data points later on. Um, we know this is actually a quadratic equation. 
uh, quadratic function, but we just don't have enough data. We somehow didn't observe the right half of data points. And we fit a linear function to the observed data points, and uh, it looks okay, right? It seems to describe data fairly well. And when I try to use that function to make a prediction for an input, say an input value here, then we will see the actual difference. The, the error this will make is absolutely huge, right? So we're extrapolating, we're estimating the function values outside the range of data points that I actually observe. So this is known as linear extrapolation and that tends to give you a lot of problems. Okay, so uh, we need nonlinear functions and we'll, we, we will look at the simplest nonlinear function uh, that we could learn uh, after we take a break. <laughs>